Welcome to tonight's Simon Wiesenthal lecture, the last one this year in 2013. And let me immediately welcome and also introduce our today's lecturer, Professor Maria Kovac from Budapest. She's a historian, finished her university degrees in Budapest, and her candidacy, candidacy which is kind of an equivalent to the Austrian habilitation at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and she's a member of this body too. From 1992 until 1997, she was assistant professor at mod for modern European history at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, and currently she is professor of history and chair of the nationalism, nationalism studies program at the Central European University in Budapest. Her research interests and publication concern issues of anti-Semitism, right-wing movements, ethnicity, minority rights, and nationalism in the interwar period, especially in Hungary. She is a member of numerous boards of scientific institutions and magazines, and is also active in the Roma Access Program of the Soros Foundation, as well as in the Open Society Institute in Budapest. Her earlier publications dealt with the history and problems of Hungarian liberal liberalism, the relationship between non-Jewish and Jewish Hungarians, ethnicity and citizenship, women and e ethnic questions, minority rights in general. One of her major works, also available in English, was published at Oxford University Press, I think in 1995, under the title Liberal Professions and Illiberal Politi Politics, Hungary from the Habsburgs to the Holocaust. Her latest book title in English, although it is not available yet in English, is Disenfranchised by Law, the History of the Hungarian Numerous Clauses, 1918, 1919 till until 1945, which is also the title of today's lecture. This book was published last year, 2012, in Budapest. The publication of this book is, is and was accompanied by numerous in-depth articles and contributions of different aspects of the official and state or church-enforced anti-Semitism in haughty Hungary. Some of her forthcoming articles, mostly in English, deal with questions of ethnopolitics and ethnic citizenship. Here I would also like to mention that before 1989 and in the way of building her academic career. Maria Kovac was also politically active. She was one of the founding figures, a major activist in the think tank of the Hungarian democratic opposition against the communist Kada regime. I welcome Maria Kovac. And Thank you, Bela. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm really and truly honored to, uh, to have been invited to deliver uh, tonight's uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal lecture. Um, let me begin my presentation by, by saying that uh, I received uh, this invitation uh, for the lecture after the launch, of, a few days after the launch of my new book on the history of the Hungarian numerous clauses law. Starting in 1920, this law introduced a mechanism to keep Jews out of universities. All applicants to the universities were, from 1920, screened as to whether or not they were Jewish, either by religion or by birth. Jewish applicants were listed separately from other applicants, and their admission was possible only up to 6% of all students which corresponded to the share of Jews in the overall population of Hungary. After a minor modification of the law in 1928, the law remained in force until the spring of 1945. Thus, it spanned um, a history of 25 years. But despite this long history, 25 years, Few topics in Hungarian interwar history remain so insufficiently understood by Hungarian historians and also by the Hungarian public as the story of the Numerus Clausus. Which is why, in my book, I present a detailed account of those mitigating legends that still in our day serve 
to understate the significance of this law. I argue in the book that government level anti-Semitism in Hungary was a story in and of itself. Um, a story whose beginnings predated the coming to power of Nazism in Germany by over a decade. The evidence in my book calls into question the legend that Hungarian anti-Semitism would have been a policy only externally imposed by Nazi Germany and only from the 1930s. Quite on the contrary, I'm suggesting that the significance of the law can hardly be overstated. It was this law that elevated to the plane of government policy the idea that the so-called Jewish question could and should be resolved by extraordinary legislation that applied to Jews and only to the Jews. Um, despite the fact that before 1920, no such thing as a Jewish nationality existed in Hungarian law, the numerus clausus law considered Jews as a so-called non-Hungarian nationality, even though most Jews in Hungary spoke Hungarian. Um, on uh, the picture I have on this uh, whiteboard, I'm trying to show you how this was done. This is uh, a photo of the implementation decree of the numerus clausus law, um, an attachment to the implementation decree. It lists the proportion of all linguistic nationalities which is then used to determine the ceiling for admission of students belonging to those nationalities. But as you see with the red arrow, which is my addition to the original, the decree and the attachment to the decree created a new special category for the Jews, even though the Jews were Hungarian speakers, um, to make sure that this more than dubious procedure uh, you see, taking Israelites for a separate nationality. This was against the law at the time. So to make sure that this more than dubious procedure was well understood by the university admission committees, the table contained this subheading, which pointed out that Jews are taken to be a national, as a nationality. So, with this, for the purposes at least of university admissions, Jews were to be cons considered as members of this newly constructed so-called nationality, irrespective of the language that they spoke. And with this, the law created a unique rule for Jews, a rule that did not apply to any other Hungarian-speaking citizen of the country. A unique rule. In this way, at least as far as university admissions were concerned, the law effectively withdrew from Jews their status as equal citizens. This was the mechanism that made the numerus clausus law so important and so valuable in the eyes of anti-Semitic politicians. Among them, Prime Ministers Pár Teleki and Jula Gömbös, respective Prime Ministers. They regarded the adoption of the Jewish quota in 1920 as a decisive breakthrough. That, in effect, opened up the political system for further anti-Jewish legislation in the future. They expected that the concept of the numerus clausus proportionality was to be extended sooner or later to be applied in the business economy and other occupations. In other words, the university Jewish quota was regarded by Hungarian anti-Semites as 
a first step. Um, in anticipation of further anti-Jewish legislation that would, in the long run, reduce the share of Jewish participation in the Hungarian economy. Um, I would um, like to mention two examples that illustrate the power with which this prototype legislation was imprinted in the minds of interwar politicians. My first example is that of Gyula Gömbös, Prime Minister from 1932, who in 1920, when the numerous clauses law was adopted, the university Jewish quota, explicitly, Gömbös explicitly spoke of the need to introduce a 5% numerous clauses in all fields of the economy. And then, uh, throughout the 1920s, he repeated this plan several times before his nomination as Prime Minister. My second example is Miklos Horty himself, who, writing his memoirs in exile in 1953, still used the term numerous clauses not only to cover the 1920 law, but also to describe the anti-Jewish legislation of the late 1930s, so the legislation of the late 1930s that restricted the rights of Jews in the Hungarian economy and also deprived many Jews from their voting rights. In my judgment, Horty was perfectly correct to apply the term numerous clauses to the anti-Jewish legislation of the 1930s. Although these laws were of an incomparably larger scale than that of 1920, they were indeed based on the very same logic and on the very same procedure of extraordinary legislation as was the numerous clauses of 1920. So on the whiteboard, you see an excerpt from Horty's memoirs. Um, when he, he talks about the 20% numerous clauses <coughs> referring to the law of 1938, and then uh, he talks about the 6% numerous clauses referring to the um, law of anti-Jewish law of 1939. But um, if all of this is true, then uh, how is it possible, we may ask, that a number of our historians in Hungary, among them even those who otherwise do a decent job of establishing the responsibility of the Horthy regime in the Hungarian Holocaust, still portray the 1920 legislation as a relatively mild and benign story, a story that has analogies elsewhere, for instance in the United States, and uh, they insist on coming back to this comparison, comparing the Hungarian numerous clauses to the numerous clauses in the United States, the Ivy League schools. Um, the argument they're making is that because there was also a numerous clauses in the United States, especially in the Ivy League schools, this type of legislation simply cannot be regarded as a first step leading to a larger tragedy. In my view, this is uh, apologetic. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about why. The reason why is because conditions in Hungary were fundamentally different from conditions in the United States. First, as you see on the whiteboard, in Hungary, the numerous clauses established a Jewish quota for all universities in the country. Whereas, if you look at the United States, you see that those Jews who were excluded from the Ivy League schools, that is, that is marked with the yellow star, uh, 
um, could pursue their studies in hundreds of other universities. So that's one big difference. If you were Jewish in Hungary, there was no university where the numerus clausus did not apply to you. But second, unlike in the United States, in Hungary, the university numerus clausus was conceived as a first step in the effort to establish a comprehensive quota system in all fields of life. That did not exist in the United States. Um, let me refer to one speech by Pa Teleki, who was prime minister both in 1920, when the university numerus clausus was established, and in 1939, when the so-called second Jewish law was passed. Speaking in the upper house in 1928, Telaki had this to say. Um, I'm quoting now Telaki. We must see sincerely and clearly that we are in the midst of a war of races. Full equality for the Jews would create an impossible situation. To deny this, is nothing but a polite formula characterized by Max Nordau to be among, excuse my pronunciation, the conventionelle Lügen der Kulturmenschheit, end of quote. Telaki then went, to this, uh, went on to describe the Jewish quota as an indispensable instrument to help Hungarians regain, as he said, their power to life by adopting the numerus clausus to all areas of life. But if indeed this was what the numerus clausus was about, in the eyes of such important politicians as Gumbösch, Telaki, and not to speak of even more radical anti-Semites, then one may ask, why all the effort to downplay the importance of this law? instead of confronting its true significance. Um, here I would like to suggest that the answer to these questions is to be found in the wider context of Hungary's current memory wars. The stakes in these current memory wars are high because, of course, they relate to how Hungarians today deal with their past. On the one side of the debate, we find those who argue that state-sanctioned government-level anti-Semitism related to the numerus clausus law was a short episode that belonged to the crisis-torn years of the early 1920s. According to this view, anti-Semitism as state policy ceased after 1928 and was only revived in the mid-1930s as a consequence of German pressure. Um, for the purposes of today's talk, I will name this line of argument the suspension thesis. Its proponents point out that in 1928, the Hungarian government amended the legislation and eliminated the explicitly anti-Semitic formulations from the law on the request of the League of Nations. In this reading, then, the formal amendment of the law in 1928 resulted in a genuine break with anti-Semitic policies, which then only reappeared in uh, Hungary in the 1930s under overwhelming German pressure. All in all, proponents of the suspension thesis maintain that by 1928, the consolidation of the Horthy regime produced a genuine and decisive turn away from the initial anti-Semitism of the regime. Okay, so this is one side of the debate. On the other side of the debate, we find a competing narrative, one that points to the effective continuity of anti-Semitism as state policy in the Horthy regime all the way from 1920 to 1944 even if the intensity of anti-Semitism changed with the passing of years. 
This account does not consider the year 1928 to have been a decisive turning point. It maintains that anti-Semitism was continuously present all throughout the Horthy regime. For the sake of this talk, I will refer to this account as the continuity thesis. So what I'm going to do in the rest of my time is to concentrate on one aspect of the history of the Hungarian numerus clausus, namely the 1928 reform. And uh, I hope this may help us to, uh, to better understand the current debate and its implications. So I will proceed in three consecutive steps. First, I will briefly talk about the numerous clauses of 1920. Second, I will describe the 1928 amendment. And third, I will give an account of the ways and means with which the Jewish quota was held up after 1928, despite the formal amendment of the law. So, let me get to my first point about the Jewish quota of 1920. Um, it's important to remember that the university Jewish quota was not the only anti-Semitic policy introduced in 1920. To name just a few fields, Jews were discriminated against in the revision of small trade licenses, that's cinema, tobacco shops, alcohol shops, um, they were discriminated against in the selective designation of Jewish-owned land to be distributed in the land reform, in the dismissal of Jewish teachers from schools, and in employment in public administration. So these were areas where um, there was tacit anti-Jewish discrimination from 1920. Um, moreover, large numbers of long-time Jewish permanent residents were refused formal Hungarian citizenship. But while all these uh, policies that I, list, I listed were tacit, so they had no codified legal basis, the numerous clausus was an openly acknowledged, explicit policy that codified the discrimination of Jews at the universities. As a result of this legislation, thousands of, of, thousands of Jewish applicants were refused admission to higher education. Overall, the proportion of Jews at Hungarian universities dropped from over 25% in 1918 to 8.3% by 1928. So I now move on to my second item namely the 1928 Amendment. This is sort of the, the, the crucial point uh, around which the debate uh, happens in today's historiography. In this amendment, um, the, uh, this amendment is presented by advocates of what I call the suspension thesis. Um, that uh, this reform, the 1928 amendment, constituted a decisive turn away from earlier trends of discrimination. But in fact, as I'll explain to you in a few minutes, this is no more than a legend. So what was this amendment and why a false legend around it? The pressure to amend the law came from the League of Nations from 1922 onwards. The League did not request Hungary to get rid of the entire numerous clauses legislation because the League had no problem with the system of closed numbers, numerous clauses, which authorized the government to limit the number of admitted students in any given year. In fact, ever since it was introduced in 1920, this is how it happens even today. What the League did request was that Hungary eliminates from the legislation all references, what I showed you in the beginning of this talk, to the nationality um, proportions uh, 
and, uh, and the, the proportions of races. In other words, what the, Jew, uh, the League of Nations was after is that Hungary should eliminate the Jewish quota from the law. But for six years after 1922, the Betlan government refused to modify the law. Um, Prime Minister Betlan himself considered the Jewish quota as a legitimate instrument, a useful instrument to restrict the role of Jews in Hungary. As he said in 1924, um, the numerous clauses was in the interest of the Hungarian state. And it was to be held up for as long as I, I'm now quoting Betlen, for as long as the sons of the Christian middle classes who represent a race that is adequate to the historical traditions of our country will again become leaders of the nation. End of quote. So therefore, because Betlen, in fact, strongly believed in the usefulness and legitimacy of the numerous clauses, he was steadfast in his opposition to any change in the law, as demanded by the League of Nations. And he, in fact, rejected five opposition motions to eliminate the Jewish quota from the law. What finally changed his mind by 1927 was very strong pressure from the League of Nations. This happened when the League warned Hungary that the Jewish quota may end up being examined by the Permanent Court of International Justice. At this time, discussions started between Betlen and Klebesberg, his Minister of Culture. In a letter, Kuno Klebesberg advised Betlen on how to proceed. I quote Klebesberg, as a lawyer, I can see quite clearly that the way our law is currently phrased, that is, until 1927, we cannot confront the Cour Permanent in The Hague, in the Hague with any hope of success. We will therefore have to revise the law but not in order to unleash thousands of Jewish university students on the nation once more, but rather in order to rescue the meaning of the entire enterprise by taking certain rational actions. Um, in this regard, Klebesberg continued, I'm this is a confidential letter to Betlen. I have my ideas, such as stressing alongside intellectual ability, the ranking of good manners and physical education. I would consider the complete opening of the floodgates as a catastrophe and therefore I think it is necessary to construct with the cooperation of discrete Christian politicians a text that will give no pretext for interference from Geneva or The Hague. End of quote. So, as we can see uh, from uh, Klebesberg's uh, letter to Betlen, all of his suggestions were meant to advise Betlen on how to continue with the Jewish quota by formally eliminating it. Klebesberg's advice was to pacify the League of Nations, but to do so in such a way that most Jewish students should still be kept out of the universities which is exactly what happened in the 1928 amendment. This amendment was a camouflage, it was deceptive, it was a sham. Indeed, as the League demanded, the original Jewish quota was eliminated from the law. Um, 
but it was replaced with a new quota, the so-called occupational quota, in Hungarian foglalkozási quota. This new quota restricted the admission of applicants on the basis of the father's occupation. And the internal proportions of the occupational quota were deliberately developed based on occupational statistics in such a way as to prevent any significant increase in the proportion of Jews within the new system. They imposed greater restrictions on those occupations in which Jews were found in larger numbers. So this way, the new quota was simply a recodified Jewish quota coded in a new disguise. Um, this fact did not escape the attention of the League of Nations either. Lucien Wolf, who evaluated this amendment for the League, wrote the following. We cannot say that we are totally satisfied with this draft. But it does remove all references to differentiation by nationality or religion from the law. And after all, this is what we asked for. Um, the new categories included in the law, namely the occupational quota, seem to be superfluous. And the possibility exists that they can be used for anti-Semitic purposes. At the moment, however, we are not trying to criticize this. Our point of departure had to be that the Hungarian government had acted in good faith. And with this, the League of Nations took the issue off the agenda. The results were as can be expected. In 1929, just as in previous years, over 75 to 80 percent of all Jewish applicants were rejected as opposed to the 15 percent rejection rate among non-Jewish applicants. There was, for uh, three, four years, a slight but only cosmetic increase in the proportion of admitted Jews so that uh, to hold this up in the communication with the League of Nations. In fact, from 1928, from the time of the amendment, every university in Hungary was obliged to notify by telegraph um, on the religious background of admitted students to notify not the Ministry of Culture, but the foreign ministry. So in the archives, I, I, I confront these telegrams. Telegram from Peach University Dean. Um, we report that in the current admission cycle, the proportion of admitted Jewish students is this and this. And this is going, as I say, not to the Ministry of Culture, who's, who's uh, uh, in principle, uh, whose uh, uh, field uh, uh, higher education would be, but to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I, think, I think one can have hardly a better evidence as to show what this was really about than these telegrams. Um, but so um, there was a three, three, four years in which there was this 1% um, per year uh, increase in the proportion of admitted students. But uh, according to contemporary uh, calculations uh, that come from university offices of the time, had the restrictions on Jews really be removed, the proportion of Jews would have reached at least at the minimum 20 to 25 percent. But even this slight cosmetic improvement came to an end as early as 1932, which uh, in our table 
uh, will become evident only in 1934, um, and I can, I can tell you in the discussion session why. With the coming to office of Gyula Gömbös, the proportion of Jews among first, first year admissions soon dipped lower than had been their proportion in the 1920s. By 1935, admission numbers for Jews were lower than in the worst years of the 1920s. And by 1938, their proportion was down to below 4%, lower than any number ever experienced in the 1920s. So, to sum up, um, I think it should be sufficiently clear um, that the 1928 amendment did not bring any genuine turn. There was indeed a change, but this change was purely formal and did not eliminate the Jewish quota from actual practice. Um, so in conclusion, I'm coming back to uh, a point I made in the initial part of uh, my talk, um, namely that it is fair to say that the Jewish quota at the universities was in force throughout the entire span of the Horthy regime, despite its cosmetic minor relaxation um, for four years between 1928 and 1932. The legend that anti-Semitic discrimination at the universities would have been suspended following 1928 is no more than a legend. A legend that can only serve the purposes of turning interwar Hungarian history into a history which is, uh, and I'm now quoting Charles Meyer's famous phrase, which is a usable history. That is a history that Hungarians can use, even though it is based on false foundations. A history which is based on false foundations and presents the Horthy regime better, more humane than it actually had been. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope uh, that this talk now opens broad possibilities for discussion, and I'm waiting for your questions or remarks. Thank you very much for this extremely informative uh, talk. I'm puzzled by only one thing. Why people uh, in Hungary could argue, use the American universities uh, as a disculpatory example. I'm puzzled by that for the following reason. The uh, universities, uh, after all, as you said yourself and made very clear, uh, the Horthy measures are a policy that were declared by law and not by the individual universities. That is, there was a policy imposed upon the universities simply because the universities are state institutions and uh, the teachers at universities are civil servants. There is the term state university in the United States. Uh, the Ivy League universities are not state universities, as we know. But uh, if, if you're on, your, full, on your, your picture there, it was quite clear that a great many of the universities could be called state universities, but they're not state universities in the way that you know, so universities here are state universities. Uh, the professors at those institutions were never civil servants. Um, so we're not talking about the same kind of thing at all. And the Jewish quotas that existed in the Ivy League were, of course, had nothing to do with law at whatever. They were uh, informal, in quotes, informal measures uh, that uh, were well known but were nonetheless secret <laughs> in a formal sense, never communicated uh, in public. So why do the people in Hungary who use this argument think they can get away with it? Are they simply speculating with the ignorance of their listeners? Um, I, I, shall I uh, respond or, yeah. Um, 
I think your last point, you know, are, are they uh, speculating on the ignorance? Uh, yes, partly they're speculating on the, of the, on the ignorance of the, of the public. Um, but there's more to this um, um, than that. So, so first of all, first of all, um, when a historian would uh, come to the public uh, or in a, in a talk, in a media, and say, but there was numerous clauses in the United States too. Um, and you know, not, not analyzing what kind of numerous clauses were, but this thing existed in the United States too. That's shocking for a Hungarian audience who never actually um, read or studied the, the history of this, uh, of this whole um, problem. So that's, uh, that, that's um, number one. In fact, uh, um, uh, I also want to make the point, and, and you very well uh, brought this out in your, in your comment, that even though the, the um, Hungarian universities were not all covered 100% from state budget, because uh, uh, the biggest university, the Pazmány, was uh, covered 50% uh, 50, 50 from the state and the, the church. But 50% uh, of its budget came from tax money. And uh, here, you know, I, I really think it's important to point out that actually Jews were never given tax relief on the proportion, proportionate to what uh, their, the opportunities of their children was restricted in. So th that's an important point. But um, after say, having said all what, what that, um, I think this whole problem deserves a deeper look. Because uh, indeed in the United States and, 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 uh, and, and when our historians you know, stress the US comparison, but indeed, we know that in the United States there were nasty racial laws, if not for against the Jews, but against the blacks. And in fact, uh, the way these nasty racial laws, racist laws, were adopted is not all that different from the way the Hungarian numerous clauses law was adopted, so that there was an, um, an emancipation uh, in the 19th century, and then two, three, four decades after the emancipation, states, in the US, the southern states, one by one, one after the other, adopted the Jim Crow laws and established the segregated, uh, segregation um, of whites and blacks. And so, um, a deeper look into the problem of racial laws, the existence of race, racist laws in a certain, um, country lead to or contribute to a larger tragedy, which in the Hungarian case is, of course, the Holocaust, so mass murder. I think it is a legitimate question to ask why in the United States racial laws did not lead to mass murder. It's important to, to study this issue um, because the the, the sequence of these events is, uh, is what makes uh, the 1920 numerous clauses so terribly important. Yeah. If I may respond briefly. Uh, I don't want to dominate the discussion, but in that one issue, I think it's important to remember that if we were really to, we were really to try to carry out a comparison simply in the area of higher education, we would have to look for universities in Hungary um, that admitted only Jews, and that were separate institutions uh, for them. Uh, I don't know if they existed no. in the 20s and 30s, but I would doubt it. <laughs> there were such universities for, for black people in the United States. I'm not going to argue that they were of equal quality uh, to those uh, for the whites. Uh, it's more like apartheid in that case uh, than anything that happened in Hungary. But you're absolutely right that it's a valid uh, topic to bring up and discuss. Could you say something about the, the motivation? I mean, was the motivation for the uh, Hungarian law the same motivation as for the American universities? Uh, 
Or if, if not, what were the differences? Um, yes and no. So um, um, there, there were. Um, I did read uh, some excellent monographic studies on uh, on the American numerus clausus, and uh, one gets the impression that, uh, that there's a lot of. Um, Justification for the for the introduction of the Jewish quota at these Ivy League universities, which is very similar uh, to the justification in uh, in Europe or in in this in this case in Hungary, um, meaning that uh, that um, the the dominant positions in our society should we, sh we should make sure that the dominant positions in our society. Um, Go with the, I don't know the the uh, the expression there, but let's say Christian or, or this is a, this is explicitly um, mentioned in this uh, text. So so there is there is this kind of similarity. Um, there is one aspect of what this problem that doesn't exist in the United States, which is uh, the experience uh, in Hungary of the communist revolution of uh, 1919, um, which uh, um, gave young Jewish intellectuals such a platform that um, gave, let's say, gave justification for, for anti-Semites to claim that this is uh, that the Jew young Jewish intellectuals are the are the kinds of intellectuals which we don't want to train, um, and that was a very explicit uh, argumentation and justification at the time that the that the law was adopted, and this was also uh, a view that was shared by Betland, Klebersberg, Gumbush. Um, uh, so, so these teleki, these leaders uh, in Hungary. So, um, so, so this is one big difference. But, but I say there's more to that, more difference to, than that. And also in my lecture, I try to point out that uh, for many of our important politicians, and here um, I, I take Betlen, I put him on one side, and I take teleki and Gumbes, I put him on another side. Um, they wanted more than just a university Jewish quota. They wanted a Jewish quota in the economy. And that was the real issue. Why it was only at the universities that this uh, was adopted in 1920, I can go on explaining why, or, or giving hypotheses, my explanations why. But uh, that's, a, that's, an, that's another point on which the American experience and the, and the the, uh, the Hungarian experience simply cannot be compared because I know of no such movement in the United States which would have seriously counted on establishing a Jewish quota uh, in the economy. I, 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 I doubt that, that that could have happened. Um, Professor Kovac, did you find any evidence in the material about the reaction of academia itself to the numerous clauses or to what, if it existed, the civil society or the students and their families uh, considering thinking of today there perhaps would have been some reaction to the law? So how was the reception in the public and in academia? So, I don't think I can give an, an overall view of all the public. And we are in 1920, so this is a terrible time in, 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 in Hungary. Um, um, half of the country is detached. Lots of refugees in the, in the country. They live in trains because uh, they, 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 there are no places to house, house them. Um, pogroms are going on in the streets, atrocities. So, so, so a, a new law adopted in Parliament relating to the admission of people to universities, that's kind of, you know, if, if you put, if, if you imagine yourself in, in the condition of those times, this is not an outstanding issue. 
because there were so many other traumas that the country was trying to deal with. Um, I did um, try to uh, get a, sort of a, a deeper view of how the universities reacted. And my impression is that uh, there was quite a bit of resentment, but those who did not like this law um, distinguished themselves by not talking. In other words, the opposition to the law was a silent opposition. Uh, professors, no? Yeah. We're Jewish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, this is, this is a difficult issue because so many of the Jewish professors were, they were, number one, they were young professors, most of them, avant-garde in many ways. Um, they had a nice time in 1919, and uh, many of them fled when the communist revolution collapsed. So you don't hear their voices in 1920. Um, but uh, but uh, you do see, I mean, I, I, I do read the transcripts of uh, meetings at the universities where professors, some professors, um, voice anxieties that this is not proper, that this is not legal, that this, should, this is not compatible with our constitution. Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's really interesting because um, when uh, in 1928, this reform that I talk about is being implemented, uh, then in order to fight off the opposition, because there was opposition, even though this was a camouflage reform, to fight off the opposition of really anti-Semitic professors, you do find the government reaching out to those who were silent in 1920. So the, so the people who actually opposed the law. But this was uh, true all, 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 all uh, along the spectrum. So for instance, in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Berzevici, who was the head of the Academy of Sciences, um, was against the law. And even Betlen, who had great influence over uh, the Hungarian political elite and the, the intellectual elite and the scientific elite, scholarly elite, even Betlen could never get Berzevici to support this law. So, uh, so yes, uh, there was opposition to the, the law and, and uh, in the book I, I actually list names, uh, positions, and uh, when we get to this 1928 turning point, uh, it becomes evident that uh, this is the cadre with which even such a minor reform was going to be implemented. Uh, a question that is perhaps a bit naive, but what happened to the Roma in your population statistics? In your uh, Well, what you see here um, is... No. No, Wait. no, not this, um, yeah, yeah, in the in first the, one. What you saw in the first uh, slide, yeah. the, uh, so the upper, upper table, that's a photocopy, except for the red, uh, yeah. uh, for the red arrow, and uh, the room of civil simply didn't feature in that, uh, in that table. Um, if the question is whether or not there was uh, there were any Roma in the universities as students or as applicants or any Roma in high school, I cannot for 100% say no, but if you want my educated guess, my educated guess would be no. But uh, I personally do know or did know earlier in the 1980s a certain scholar um, who was at that time um, a U.S. citizen, with whom I had a discussion in which he disclosed to me that he was a Roma, but also asked me not to make this public. And uh, this is another um, feature that you, have to, you have to, do have to take into account, that if, for, for a very, very long time, if in Hungary, um, a Roma individual 
assimilate, uh, so, so got on the mobility ladder. At one point or another, he would lose his uh, Roma um, image. So, would not, would not consider, consider himself or publicize himself to be a Roma. And that's also maybe part of the, of the picture, but as you see um, in the eyes of the Hungarian uh, Ministry of Education and Culture, uh, this was not an issue in 1920. And there are no Roma there, which is surprising. You know, I, I because the Roma group, at least, it was uh, the same size as, as the Jewish group, probably. No, no, I, um, no, no. yeah, I, I, I don't think I, I don't. Yeah, but they have their language also. But they have their language. But they have their language also. Well, uh, in the in the nationality uh, statistics uh, statistics used by the the legislators uh, in this case, the Roma did not uh, did not feature. My question connecting to this to this table, uh, if I understood this correctly, we are not talking about, about Jews, but talking about Israelites. So the numerous clauses was against the, the Israelites. The, um, in other words, for the Horthy regime, uh, all the converted Jews speaking Hungarian or, or, or German were, were good Hungarians. And, 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 and they have the, the opportunity to, to go to the universities. It is right or, or not? <laughs> so, so, um, so, so, so there were lots of problems with the numerous clauses legislation, and this was one that um, uh, the legislation never actually gave any kind of uh, instruction on how um, universities should determine um, whether or not a, a certain Jewish in individual falls under the quota. Um, and so this was left uh, to the discretion of each admission committee. So much so that there had been universities which uh, asked for um, the papers of the applicant back two generations. And regardless of the fact which church they belong to at the moment of uh, application, if they had the Jewish ancestry, they, they fell under the quota. Uh, so for instance, the, the medical, all medical faculties uh, across Hungary used this definition, so the, the uh, Jew by origin. Um, other faculties and other universities, especially the one in Pitch, insisted that they'll only use the religious data, meaning that if uh, the applicant at the moment of application is Jewish, then um, he, he or she falls under the limitation. Um, but what's really absurd is that within a given university, various faculties use different philosophies. So there was the Jew by religion on one faculty and Jew by birth on another faculty. Um, so if if you want to to, to give a, an estimate of the numbers, I would say that uh, at least a third of those Jew, Jews who did not manage to get to the university because of the numerous clauses, at least a third did not get there because of being of Jewish origin, not because of Jewish religion. Um, it, um, it appears that uh, the 1920 um, decision of, uh, of, of uh, introducing this law is very important in your, in your analysis. So um, I was wondering whether, um, if this is a turning point, 
whether there were in the establishment and the government um, discussed different variants, or different uh, sorts of solutions, um, um, if there were differences um, in views, or if there were opponents um, to the introduction, and what were what would have the main arguments pro and against have been, and if 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 there were um, such differences. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Um, well, um, when the law was adopted, of course, when we talk about the government, we talk about, let's say, uh, Prime Minister Pat Teleki, Count Klebersberg is in the government, Betlen is at that, at that time not in the government. Um, they all knew that this was going to be trouble. So let's, uh, let's put ourselves back in 1920. Um, all these Transylvanian territories detached from Hungary. These upper Hungarian, so the Slovak territories detached from Hungary. Some little uh, territory um, in uh, Austria detached from Hungary. Um, and um, as the Hungarian politicians were trying to collect their, you know, their, their trying to, to, to come up with certain plans as to what they need to do, their priority number one was to regain these territories or to renegotiate these terrible borders. And uh, they knew that Hungary had to put itself on a diplomatic, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on some sort of a acceptance on a diplomatic level. They knew that if they introduce an anti-Jewish law, that is bad image, bad for Hungary. And so um, at the time of the adoption of the law, so in the voting in the parliament, guess who was not present? The Prime Minister was not present, so Teleki was not there. Klebersberg was not there. And at the time, the government consisted of 13 members and only one member was there. 12 members of the government were absent. Um, so really, um, as I said in the talk, um, this country, the Betland, Teleki, Klebersberg, they were in favor of the numerous clauses law. But they would have been content if there was a numerous clauses law, which, I mean, this is now getting to technicalities and I didn't want to bore you with this, but one of the steps taken by the numerous clauses law was to establish admission committees, right? Because once you have a limited number of possible uh, admissions, then you need to decide. So if you establish the admission committees, these uh, Teleki, Betlen, Klebersberg people, they were thinking, if you have admission committees, they'll take care of the problem. So it would be enough to simply establish the admission committees and then leave all the reference for the, about the nationalities and races and Jews out of the law. And this was what the discussions was, were about, whether or not you had to have an explicit uh, nationality paragraph, or whether it was enough to establish the numerous clauses, so the uh, system of closed numbers and admission committees, and then the ministry could take care of the fact that uh, these admission committees consist of people who are sympathetic to, to the purpose of the whole exercise. Um, and that they did not manage to push through the anti-Semitic uh, MPs. So in fact, uh, so in fact uh, that's how this quota was codified. Thank you for your talk. I'd like to ask a question about your larger argument, because if I understood correctly, there's a, an argument within an argument here, and the, 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 
you know, sort of the nesting, the smaller argument is that there was continuity in anti-Semitism, um, if not in, in, in means, then in intent um, before and after 1928. And that is completely persuasive from your presentation. But I wonder about the larger argument, first of all, whether I understood it correctly, and if I did, whether you know, it necessarily follows from the first argument. And what I understood is that you are arguing there's a, a line between uh, the 1920 numerous clauses legislation and um, not only anti-Jewish legislation uh, imposed under pressure from the Germans, but by implication than the Holocaust. And this seems to me as though it's perhaps an overly teleological argument if, I under, you know, if I'm not misrepresenting you. And I, I come back again to the American comparison because like Mitch, I was very struck by it. Um, it seems to me, I hypothesize that American elites were no less anti-Semitic than the Hungarian leaders, but that they were, at, the difference was the political system. Uh, it would have been very difficult um, to introduce such a law um, because it would have clearly been unconstitutional. So that there, there are all sorts of um, external contingencies that have less to do with anti-Semitism than with the nature of the political system and the historical conjuncture mm -hmm. that made anti-Semitism such a potent force within Hungary after 1938, and that therefore, to, to draw a line back to 1920, um, I see I would draw the opposite conclusion from the, the American comparison, that, that actually that um, it shows that uh, perhaps we, we, can't, we can't see a, a, a clear line between the 1920 legislation and later events. Okay. Um. I really welcome that question because it's, um, it's one of those uh, problems of interpretation that I think are really important uh, um, for us also as, an, uh, as a, um, just tonight, but also uh, for, for Hungarians to think about. Um, hmm. so, so let me rephrase what you say. I did not and I don't Thing. I didn't say and I do, do not think that uh, if a country adopts an uh, anti-Semitic numerous clauses in 1920, that that country is going to end up um, gassing Jews. And in fact, Hungary never ended up gassing Jews because there were no gassing of Jews in Hungary. That was, what, that was done in, in the camps, which were not in Hungary. Um, so the real question is, you know, adopt a law in 1920 and then expel or deport your Jewish population in 1944. Yeah. Um, and so let me, let, me, let me put it this way. I don't think that ad having adopted the numerous clauses in 1920 led straight to the gas chamber. But I do think that uh, if you want to analyze the process leading to the deportation of hundreds of thousands of Jews in 1944, you have to begin with 1920 at the least. And why? Um, because uh, it, the, the numerous clauses, uh, so, 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 so it's cruel to say, I, I believe, that the biggest damage done by the numerous clauses was not even the Jews who couldn't study at universities. That, that was terrible on the, uh, on the individual level. Um, some of them, of course, left the country. Many of them left the country. This gave rise to this great Hungarian scholars generation outside of Hungary. Um, the so-called numerous clauses um, migrants, um, but that was not the greatest damage. The greatest damage, in my view, was what it did in the minds of, um, of the population of people at large. That uh, a state policy of distinguishing uh, 
citizens according to birth or religion, um, trained people, had people get used to the idea that citizens can be distinguished in such a way. And not just people in general, but the future leaders of the country. So where were the future leaders of the country trained? At the universities, right? And what happened at the universities? Um, so a non-Jewish applicant to any university in 1920, from 1920 onwards, um, spent his or her entire university career, the university years, observing Jews not being admitted, then the, the, these uh, student organizations moving to expel Jews from the student body, those who were admitted, campaigning for the numerous nullus. So, so the idea that the, you write as a student could be called in question. Um, that's, your, if your right as a student can be called in question, then which of your right cannot? So that, that I think is the sort of the, the, the major, the, the, the major lasting effect of the numerus clausus um, in Hungarian history. But let me just add one, one more thing. We are, are historians and we are trained not to engage in counterfactuals. Um, but um, if I ask the question, if the League of Nations had survived into the 1930s, I mean, not formally, but really, um, if uh, the Western powers would have given the impression about themselves of the same strengths as in the 1920s, so in the 1930s, could uh, the amendment, the reform of the 1920s, so the Hungarian numerous clauses reform, could it have slowly, gradually resulted in a real reform? Or in a real turn away from anti-Semitism? It's a question, and, and I leave it as a question, but it's a question that we cannot answer, but nonetheless, so, so that's also to be added to the problem of the straight line, that uh, I'm, I'm not drawing a state line, straight line from 1920 to 1944, but once I investigate the antecedents of 1944, there's no way we can, uh, we can, uh, not include the numerous clauses. I want, I want briefly to return to the American comparison and then add another one uh, that maybe is of relevance to us sitting here. The, the, could you go to the second slide, please, the next one after this one? No, uh, after, the, no, the next, the table, that uh, give the percentages of Jewish students. That one, yeah. Um, what's relevant here is what you won't see on the American comparison. Um, those percentages before, up to 1914, were not even imaginable at American universities in the, in the, same, the same period. The numerous clauses, uh, the admissions quotas in the Ivy League were preventive measures. Right, they were... They were class-based. The, the aim was to make sure that they saw these Jews getting wealthier and some of them competing for admission, and they wanted to prevent them from even having the chance <laughs> to compete. Uh, comparisons are sometimes useful for, to illuminate differences, and, and that's one of them, I think, in this case. But relevant is the second comparison. Those percentages are quite comparable to the percentage of, Jews, of students of Jewish confession at the University of Vienna in the same period. Uh, not the same, but very near. Same order of magnitude. Um, and, but of course, they were also considered, those percentages, highly threatening in Vienna, 
uh, or, and uh, we have to see, think, think here, this is, this is complicated, but I'll just add one sentence about this. The percentages are only slightly higher, they're, they're radically higher than the percentage of Jews in Hungary. But those take those same numbers for Vienna, and they're only slightly higher than the percentage of Jews in the population of Vienna uh, at the same time. Uh, so it's a very complicated issue, but my, my point, the per- point I want to make is not about that, but about what happened after. What you were talking about is what happened after. So the quota of 1920 was portrayed at the time, if I understand you right, as a defensive measure against that. It said, let's make sure this never happens again, pointing to the very high number of 1918 uh, to point out how strong the threat is, right? So that, that was the immediate context. Uh, Yeah. In Vienna, all, I think almost everyone in the room was familiar with this. There were riots amongst the German, so-called German students against uh, Jewish students in the early 20s as well, and they too called for a quota, um, which didn't happen. Uh, Austrian constitution. But the fact that it didn't happen did not prevent anti-Semitism from taking hold at the Austrian universities. Yeah. First of all, um, I'm, I'm happy you bring up the, these numbers, and uh, I think this uh, outstanding number of 1918-1919 that is even uh, outstanding in, uh, with a view to the, the previous years in uh, in Hungary. So first, I'd, I I say a few words about why that was, but then I would like to get back to the 25 uh, around 25 percent. So the 36.4 percent was the first attempt of the Hungarian government to deal with these uh, students who were delayed in their studies um, during the war. They announced um, the uh, so-called make-up semesters. Students had the right to to go there with uh, less uh, workload. But they also had the right not to go there. And so the students who took the chance, took the opportunity, were overwhelmingly Jewish students. And uh, the, the politicians were saying, well, why the Jews? Why, why are not uh, the non-Jewish students, why aren't they taking these opportunities? And because they didn't take these opportunities, this pushed the advocates of the Jewish quota closer and closer to the end, to the Jew- to introducing the law. But then back to, uh, to um, the 25%. Um, you know, you will have to tell me what the proportion of Jews was in Vienna. I suspect, hmm? Pardon me? Yes. Yes, that's, that's the way I know it. But uh, Budapest, that's not the case. So, um, ask me were the, if the University of Budapest had 25% Jewish students, were Jews overrepresented in that uh, student body or not? They were not. Because uh, Jews in Budapest population made up over 23%. So talk about a 1% overrepresentation or. Um, so. That's why um, you had to have the national averages, the, you know, the, 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 the agrarian numbers introduced, because you just simply couldn't point to the, to the actual overrepresentation, um, And, and that, that was uh, pretty much uh, true of all the cities um, in which universities were found. Okay, so skip any further Thank you, Professor Kovac, for this talk. And I take the opportunity to ask you for the 23rd of January 2014 to join us for our next Simon Wiesenthal lecture.
Julia von dem Knesebeck wird über die Schwierigkeiten und die Auseinandersetzungen bei der Wiedergutmachung von Roma und Sinti nach der NS-Zeit 1945 in der Bundesrepublik Deutschland sprechen. Vielen Dank, dass Sie gekommen sind. Wiedersehen.